Hi everyone, Erica Gallantin here from Sovereignty Herbs and it is late May in the Medicine Gardens and it's just a really special, special, spectacular time of year and um, uh, it's lush. We just got a really lovely spring rain finally um, and I thought that I would take this opportunity to uh, give you a little tour around the gardens um, to uh, show you some very special plants uh, that happen to be blooming, some native medicinal plants. So I thought I'd talk to you about their botany, show you what they're looking like uh, in full bloom, and uh, maybe talk about some of their medicinal uses as well. Um, so thank you for joining and I hope you enjoy. So this is absolutely one of my favorite times of year. We've got, you know, both native and non-native species of flowering plants really starting to kick off their bloom cycles. Uh, you know, and, and with that, we have this uh, wonderful display of pollinator behavior. Um, you know, and, and not only these uh, wonderful, hardworking honeybees, um, but also a lot of really wonderful native pollinators are out and about, super excited to uh, get working on some of the beautiful uh, blooms we have available at the moment. So one of the first species I wanted to show you all, which is totally in full bloom right now, is the Ohio spiderwort and the Virginia spiderwort. So this is the Tritus cancia virginiana, is the Virginia spiderwort, and it is such a lovely, luscious color purple. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because not a lot of gardeners really like this plant, mostly because it does have a tendency to spread around the gardens. Um, but one of the coolest features, I think, are these uh, trichomes on the anthers. So the, the, the kind of hairball looking feature you have there is kind of unique to uh, the species. And yeah, and gardeners don't tend to like this plant, um, I think, because it is, it is a mover and shaker, um, although it is easily pulled up from places that you don't necessarily want to have it there. Um, and yeah, so one of the kind of main ethnobotanical uses for this plant was actually as a dye plant. You can see here when you kind of squeeze the uh, flower bud, it leaves a kind of purple juicy residue. And this is Ohio spiderwort, uh, Tritus cantia uh, ohioensis, which is slightly lighter purple um, and is kind of missing some of the um, furriness of the peduncles of the flowers. But nonetheless, they are all very much loved by the pollinators. So one of the most satisfying aspects of gardening, um, you know, not only for medicinal plants, um, for human use is also this uh, concept of, you know, growing medicinal plants for the ecosystem at large. Um, and, you know, there's, there's so much ecology that can start taking place around your home when you start bringing in some of these uh, native species. It's just really wonderful. Uh, you know, like this coral honeysuckle here is just a favorite of the hummingbirds. Um, you know, and, and uh, plants like, you know, Golden Alexander, um, you know, are, are host plants for, um, you know, really important species of, of butterflies. And you get to witness all of this um, when you bring the plants into your gardens. So another uh, species of native plant that's currently blooming is the blue false indigo. Um, absolutely stunning member of the pea family. It's got these really cool special pea-like flowers that uh, pollinators like bumblebees have to really work those back legs to get those petals open so they can get to the goods. Um, it's also a favorite of the silver spotted skipper. This is a species of butterfly that um, has an affiliation with the pea family um, and really has got quite a lovely way of getting in there with its proboscis to uh, 
get the goods. Um, so Baptisia um, has a traditional uh, medicinal use and historical medicinal use, um, but it's a very strong plant, so it's not one that's it's commonly called upon in modern times. And that brings us to uh, one of the most miraculous features of the gardens at the moment, the great Angelica, uh, Angelica atroprobria, also known as Masterwort. Um, and this is a, you know, huge, huge variety of Angelica, uh, often um, misunderstood as cow parsnip, um, but it is an Angelica species. It's incredibly aromatic. And it's got um, enormous amount of pollinator relationships. I mean, the plant is just completely abuzz. Um, and so in both, you know, kind of uh, traditional medicine as well as, uh, you know, medicine coming from uh, Europe, there's a long standing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of um, medicinal use of the dried root uh, as well as the seed to help aid and support a kind of cold, uh, stagnant digestion. Um, but this particular species of Angelica is also really phototoxic. So if you get the oils on your skin from the leaves, uh, they can leave pretty nasty burns. So you need to be careful about that. Um, it also self seeds really readily. These here are um, first year plants, really tiny babies. Hard to imagine that they're gonna be these like huge epic plants next year, um, which can get, you know, really the ones that we've got here are almost 10 feet tall. Um, which is really something else to see. And here we have arrived at Solomon seal. Um, this one is smooth Solomon seal. Um, this is a, a species that is native to the woods and forests here of uh, Southeast Ohio. Um, really wonderful kind of zigzag stem with these smooth uh, lance-shaped leaves that are um, kind of attached to the stem without a uh, stalk. And it's got these two little flowers, this is the biflorum part. So, uh, you know, these two um, pairs of flowers that kind of come down from the leaf axils um, is a, definitely a distinguishing feature of this particular species of Solomon seal. Um, and then we have the, the giant Solomon seal, which is really fascinating uh, species. And again, the ones I've got here in the gardens are, gosh, they're about four feet tall at the moment, and they've got this beautiful, brilliant green iridescence to them. Um, and, you know, you can really tell the difference between the two species, be, you know, with stature. Uh, you know, this is a much taller plant. Um, and, you know, the more mature individuals, instead of just sending down uh, pairs of flowers, you can often get these groupings of uh, even six or, or more uh, little flowers, really, really lovely. Um, and the Solomon seal has a uh, long traditional use as a connective tissue tonic and general cooling anti-inflammatory uh, remedy. So it's definitely one that's used quite a lot in herbal practice. Um, and then there's also the variegated variety. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the odoratum or the fragrant Solomon seal that's variegated. This is a native to uh, Asia and is really quite lovely, uh, albeit aggressive uh, in the gardens as well. Uh, but this is not a species that is really used medicinally by me, at least. Uh, I stick to the native species. So this is a uh, false Solomon seal. So, you know, it's, it's actually unrelated to uh, the smooth Solomon seal. Um, but as you can see, it has a lot of uh, similar features, including the kind of zigzag stems and alternate leaves coming off of the stem without any uh, stalks. But one of the features that distinguish it from the regular Solomon seal is this terminal cluster of flowers, really easy to identify. And there she is. This is a very, very young, um, first year in bloom, fringe tree. 
Um, so this is Chinanthus virginicus. Uh, this is a native uh, shrub, flowering shrub uh, it, for, you know, Ohio. And um, what's really wonderful about this um, is, you know, the bark, the bark is traditionally used as well as the root bark, uh, kind of as a bitter digestive tonic. But this is a dioecious plant, meaning that the pistillate and staminate flowers uh, exist on separate plants. So you need to have uh, one of each in order to get uh, the fruits um, and, uh, and sexual reproduction. Uh, and here we have uh, what appears to be uh, a staminate. So that's really exciting uh, because I've had this uh, planted for several years now. It's not very fast growing uh, where we've got it. And to see it in such miraculous, fragrant bloom uh, is really quite wonderful. So fringe tree or old man's beard is another common name for this, this shrub. So last but certainly not least is the false unicorn root. This is Camellarium luteum. It has a long uh, traditional uh, and historical um, legend of use uh, for supporting fertility and ovarian function. Um, but, you know, this plant is really, really at risk. Um, it's a woodland medicinal. It's a very long-lived medicinal in the lily family. Um, and the bulbs are rather small, which is, you know, the part that has been traditionally used. And so, uh, you know, harvesting um, the bulbs has just become incredibly unsustainable. Um, and, and, you know, kind of like the fringe tree, um, we just saw the, the false unicorn root has separate plants with um, the staminate and pistillate flowers. And so both uh, need to be present in order for there to be any seed production, which is the only way. Uh, that this species reproduces. And it has quite a complicated lifestyle, uh, or cycle, I should say, um, you know, whereby the, the pistillate uh, flowers bloom for a lot shorter period of time than the staminate ones. Um, you know, and this is a species that is uh, on United Plant Savers at risk list, um, you know, due to uh, habitat loss and over harvesting for medicinal use. Uh, so you should totally um, you know, try to grow it yourself and uh, spread the love. So thank you once again for joining me on this, uh, this herb walk today, this late day in May. And I look forward to uh, sharing more with you about what's blooming in the medicine gardens as the season progresses. Um, in the meantime, you can follow me on social media at The Medicine Gardener, as well as at Sovereignty Herbs. Uh, I hope you stay in touch and enjoy the amazing end of spring, beginning of summer.